Welcome to our series of Healthcare Scene interviews where we sit down with top leaders in healthcare IT. I'm John Lynn, the founder of healthcarescene.com, a network of leading healthcare IT resources. Before we begin with our interview, I want to remind those watching live that we'll talk for about 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Also, if you're watching live and you like what someone's saying or you just like that person, you can click and uh, give them props. Uh, you can also tweet on the left side and promote the, the blab. That's much appreciated if you do that. And if you do have any questions, you can do slash Q space and then add your question and that will queue it up for us. Uh, we'll do our best to cover the questions while we're talking, but if, uh, if we're not able to cover it then, we'll do it in the after party where we uh, you can join us live and you can ask questions, add your own commentary. So yeah, that's enough for the logistics. Now I want to welcome our guest, Nancy Hannon. She's the Phillips Relationship Director at Augusta University Health. I'm pleased to have you here with me today, Nancy. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Great. So let's start off by, you know, how about you tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization? Sure. Okay. Um, I've been with what is now AU Health um, for right around 22 years. I have a business background. Anything that I have that's clinical, I've picked up from working here, but my background is solely business. Uh, I've been in this role with the Phillips Alliance for about two and a half years now. Prior to this, I had a series of clinical uh, management type and director positions in heart and cardiovascular services, the medicine practice sites, women's health, a variety of different areas, um, but have typically been in the outpatient arena for the last 20 plus years. Interesting. And you're at, you said AU, Augusta University of Health, but used to be called Georgia Regents, right? Uh, That's correct. Yes. How large is the organization? I mean, what, what, what are we looking at that you're taking part in? Uh, well, we've got the medical center um, that is is who the alliance is actually a piece of. We actually mm -hmm. have a number of colleges and sciences. We have our Somerville campus, um, so it's it's a large organization, one of the largest employers in the city. I believe the second largest. Nice. So let's talk about that. The the alliance really is what you know this this blab is going to be about because I think it was a unique approach to how to approach your large medical purchases. Uh, you know, so, you know, before we get into that, though, let's talk about what was your equipment and contract situation with these large medical purchases like prior to signing this agreement with Philips? Oh, sure. Uh, well, we didn't have any specific contracts with any specific vendors. Um, we would make our selections based on a variety of factors. It might be based on price. It might be based on um, provider preference uh, for a certain type of equipment, certain vendor and that uh, the, the providers have a preference. <laughs> um, and, and we also have some longstanding relationships with different different vendors for different modalities, and so it it, it could vary. Um, we could get a new provider who had a specific piece of equipment by a specific vendor, etc. So it was a very transactional, I would say, um, somewhat disjointed disjointed way of acquiring assets and doing business. So. Mm. And I think that's fairly typical of a lot of academic medical centers, um, especially in a situation where you have very limited resources for a, a um, large number of capital needs. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always such an interesting balance. You have the CFO that never wants to replace it, any equipment because of, you know, budgeting concerns. You know, you have the department heads that kind of want their latest shiny object that they saw at a conference, right? And then you have marketing people that are watching the competitors saying, Oh, you know, you they're marketing that they have this great new machine or great new equipment and we can't do that. So there's a lot of competing priorities there, right? And Absolutely. Absolutely. Challenge. I didn't agree with what you said about the CFO though. I don't need that on uh -huh. record. Um no it, it, that's You're good. Right. I like when people disagree with me. No, no, <laughs> you you're think? absolutely right. We, um, <laughs> a lot of times we had a break fix mentality only because uh, there were very limited resources for the capital pool. And um, those were allocated into different areas. And then there's a long list of requests and assets from each area that obviously greatly exceeded the, the budget. So some spend would occur, dollars would be saved in the event of an emergency, and we would roll along and, um, and do business that way. Yeah, it seems like the, the large equipment's easily to be easy, something easy to cut when cuts come to every budget, you know, because they're like, oh, we could just limp along for one more year, right? <laughs> sure, sure. And, and also, when you do have to replace a really expensive piece of equipment, you um, it's a jar to your resources, obviously. It's, you know, spend a million or whatever you're spending for the for the widget, and that's that's hard to overcome. 
So. Right. Now it throws off all their their planning. So so yeah, I mean, so those are some of the challenges. Now now tell us about the alliance with Philips and, and you know why did you go with that and, and how does that help to solve the challenges? Obviously. Sure. Well, um, our medical center we have a 478 bed adult hospital. We have a 145 bed Children's Hospital of Georgia that offers the highest level of um, neonatal intensive care and critical care. We're the region's only level one trauma center. And um, we have 80 outpatient clinics uh, with both primary care and specialized care. And um, I say that because I think it relates to your question about the challenges. <laughs> um, so a lot of them, we have, we have finances. We have the challenge of what we call kind of transactional relationships. Um, we need a CT or we need an ultrasound and it's in a very compartmentalized arena. And you, you go out and you do your research and you try to buy that and you hope that the vendor's giving you the right advice and not trying to sell you a Bentley when you really need maybe a Camry. Um, and after you make the purchase, you may hear from the vendor again or you might not. And they're not there with you when you decide that you either didn't get enough or you got you way overshot what your actual actual um, clinical need was. So I think that was sort of the nature. Um, and, you know, the changes in healthcare. Um, the spend, I would say, in, in healthcare, we keep having to ratchet down for a number of constraints that I won't go into because that's an entire other podcast. But <laughs> we have to tighten our finances. And meanwhile, Philips and other vendors are creating all this awesome technology and the state of the art stuff that we definitely want. And how do you try to bridge that gap between the two? Interesting. So you have those challenges. I think it's interesting the idea that they sell it to you, you make the purchase and you kind of disappear, which I think a lot of people will relate to that experience. Uh, I hate to sound negative about it, but I think, I mean, that's just business. That's just the nature of, of um, sales and, and the way typically you do, you do those kinds of transactions. So, yeah. Yeah. So how did that change with the, the, the Alliance? You know, how did it really come about that you decided to do the Alliance with Phillips? Well, at the, at the time that this idea was um, came into play, our, our leadership at the time, um, our CEO had tried to do a, an alliance with Phillips at a previous hospital, and uh -huh. the timing for that one um, just wasn't right. But he looked at our, I believe, our finances, our aged equipment, our lack of resources or, or limited resources, and um, viewed this as the right time to, to try to launch this again. So um, basically my understanding, and this predates my heavy involvement in the project, but my understanding is um, through one of our clinical leaders, one of our um, radiologists, uh, touched base with two Phillips representatives that were here on campus a lot, um, some of our salespeople who we have a longstanding relationship with, and, and said, hey, this is something that we're thinking about doing. Do you think you all might want to partner with us on this or at least uh, discuss it further? And that's how the wheels started turning. And so why, why did you choose Philips? Was it just because of the breadth of the options that they had available? Was it because they were willing or you know, any ideas of why, why you selected them? Well, Philips already had agreements of this nature with some other European um, partners. And so I believe our CEO was aware of that. And, and again, he had, he had had some conversations with them previously, is my understanding. And so when he reached out to them, they were, they were familiar with what he was talking about and, and wanted to, to further develop the idea and see if it was mutually beneficial. So the, for those watching, can you describe a little bit more? What, what does the alliance include? What does it not include? You know, what, what's an overview of what, what came together in this uh, in this alliance you created? Sure. Well, we've talked a lot about equipment replacement, which for the first two years, that that obviously has been a big piece of this because of our, our um, aging technology. So we call the first two years kind of the, the year of the 18 wheeler because we replaced entire fleets. But it's a lot more than that. It's, it's not just replacing imaging equipment or monitoring. It also includes consulting services and um we can chat some about some of the, the um, interesting projects that they've helped us with. It also, um, now we're kind of getting into the, what I call the fun stuff. We are spinning up an innovation program uh, that includes Phillips providing an innovation director. We're in the process of hiring ours and um, mutually agree upon seed money where they try to help um, redefine the patient experience, which is kind of what this is all about, uh, making this better for the patients and rethinking everything together from the vendor perspective and from, from the healthcare provider perspective. So. It's almost like they're using you as, as part of their research budget, right? And, you know, 
Um, there is a research component that is separate from the, the piece of the alliance that I work on. This is actually innovation. And as I told you, I'm a business person, so I'm learning this as I go along. But there, there is quite a difference between innovation and research. And the part that we're working on with them is the innovative piece. And, um, you know, Philips is a company that, that's got roomfuls of people um, working on innovation, um, an incredible amount of resources. And it's something that the hospital, for the most part, hasn't embarked on. So it's a unique and, and just a fantastic opportunity for us to be able to partner with them on that. So what's the difference between innovation and research? Is it more the innovation is stuff that's already there and practical and available? Or what, how would you uh, define the difference? Well, you know, innovation could be could be lots of different things. It could be looking at some of our – innovation could mean that we figure out that, that a piece of equipment we have maybe needs some different um, – different components or different different pieces that might improve the patient experience. Innovation could be looking at process and trying to figure out, is that process broken? Mm -hmm. um, one of the first pieces that we've been working on has to do with some cardiac triage, how to um, improve door to balloon time from the time the call is made to the EMTs, to the time that the patient gets to the hospital, and even to the point where they're leaving and how do we concentrate on um, home health and, and making sure that they don't end up, you know, back with us and, in, in, you know, within 90 days. So I know that's not a great explanation, but there's a, it, it, it's just different. There's, there's, it's, it's a different type of, as opposed to trying to get, um, RB approval and, and um, working in a lab. It's just, it's just a different, different. It's approach. almost like business is innovation. And uh, if it was clinical, it would be research. It's almost, it's almost it almost feels like that the, the way you describe it. Uh, mm, well, not always, <laughs> I mean, there's certainly there's innovation in clinical as well. Interesting. Absolutely. So, so, you know, what, what have been the benefits or the challenges of having a long-term relationship like this? Uh, and, and kind of along with that, it, you know, it seems like if I were an organization, I'd be a little scared, right? Having this long-term relationship, what if they don't deliver? You know, how do I get out of it? You know, what, what's your take on, on the, the benefits and challenges? And is there an out? <laughs> uh well, uh, yes, there is an out. Um, I would say the benefits are there is an out, but we are we are um, we are all in, so we haven't had to look at that. I'll, I'll address that piece first since we started talking about it. We um, at the time the alliance was put together, obviously there was a rather robust legal document that was put together that includes the structure of the alliance, what's included, how um, you know what's our oversight body, all kinds of different work teams and finances. And so there, there is an out clause. And um, for those of us who work on this project daily, we kind of talk about it like a marriage. Um, it, it, it's a merger. So um, there, there is an out clause. If either party was involved, I guess like a lot of marriages, it would be expensive for both parties. And we, we definitely don't want to part ways that way. There is an out. The benefits, though, um, have been incredible. Phillips has embedded resources here with us. We have engineers who are here, um, you know, all the time working on issues as they come up rather than having to call Atlanta or wherever they need to be deployed from. Often the exact resource we need is either here or at home asleep and can be quickly brought in um, when equipment goes down. We have an on-site full-time education manager who, you know, with all the equipment that's rolled out, certainly there's been a huge educational component with that. Um, we also have my counterpart who's relocated here and then a number of other executives that help with the technology piece and, and different aspects of the, um, the program. And so not only are those folks embedded here in the hospital, but they've, they've actually moved here. They're part of our community. Their spouses have joined the workforce and their children are in our schools. And, and it's, it's a very, very unusual situation between um, a traditional vendor and a, a healthcare center. So that just feels different. And so um, when we have our triumphs, they're here with us to enjoy those. And when issues come up, they're here to work through those with us one piece at a time as well. Uh, they've allowed us to have greater consistency, obviously, with our, our equipment. We are in the process of rolling out an entire new fleet of AEDs and defibrillators, um, hopefully at the beginning of the fiscal year. And what that means is, you know, one piece of equipment, one type of equipment, no matter where the medical student or the resident or, or the the nurse or the physician, whoever it is, wherever they go, is the exact same piece of equipment. It makes education much more straightforward. And ultimately, it, it's better for the patient. Um, those have been some, some fun projects to work on. Another one that I would say is, that 
you know, was a bit of a surprise when we went to um, look at our ven ventilator fleet. It was time to look at that. We have a number of vents and apparently um, vents are, are a piece of equipment that just kind of kind of keep on ticking. They even though you might say they need to be replaced in X number of years, they often far outlast that and, and work at, at an appropriate level. So when it was time to look at all those vents and the replacement, uh, we went to the director of respiratory therapy and, and the, the um, Phillips representative went and talked with her, who was also a respiratory therapist. So it was a great combination. Nice. And nice. the director from respiratory, rather than saying, yes, I want all new vents, and, and, and we had the funding to do that, said, you know, I really don't want all new vents. What I need are a few more vents than what I have, so I can get rid of the ones that I'm leasing right now. And I need these retrofitted for both adults and children. And I need to make sure that no matter what the acuity level of the patient, the same vent can work for every patient. Um, so sounds like a pretty easy solution, but it was it was um, has made a huge change for respiratory. They no longer have to trade out a vent when a patient's acuity level changes, and and you know. Go get a go find a vent <laughs> that was on the patient so it can be redeployed. Um, we've had a very high census in our hospital over the last few months, and not at any point did we run out of ventilators. And so it's it's um, hard to put a price on that. Obviously, not having to lease the ventilators have been great. The, the true benefit is for the patient, but and for many reasons, it means that respiratory therapist instead of trying to trade, you know find a vent and trade it out and chase it down is actually there with the patient, treating them for a longer period of time. Um, the education on having, again, one type of vent is much easier and the staff loved it. Um, in fact, when our director of respiratory, who's very high energy and, and um, just a, a very innovative thinker herself, when she went to tell her staff what the plan was, they actually cheered. That's how excited they were because they knew it allowed them to do their job better and to take care of their patients better. So. Nice. That doesn't yeah. happen very often in, in uh, healthcare. Hey, we're going to implement this and they cheer. <laughs> right. And, and we didn't have to have all new equipment and we saved money in the process. Well, and I think that's one, you know, if, if I'm playing devil's advocate, you know, about, okay, well, with these agreements, that's great. But in some ways, it almost feels like you're, you're, you're getting in bed with the vendor and they're just going to tell you, you always need to replace stuff, right? Uh, I, I, that would be my fear, you know, that, you know, hey, well, you're just, oh, you know, of course you want to give me the most cutting edge. And of course, the safest thing for healthcare is to have the latest and greatest machine and to replace it on a regular cycle. We'd all love that, but is that the smartest thing? And do we really need to do that to improve? Right. How do you balance that in the relationship so that they're not always just selling you more stuff, right? Sure. Well, um, in, in our plan, our roadmap is what we call our technology um, mapping plan. We refer to it as the TMP. We kind of live and die by that. And so before the alliance was actually si signed, um, a group came in and inventoried all of our equipment, imaging and monitoring. Uh, they saw what year it had been um, put into service, how old it was, what's the normal life cycle, and uh, when does it need to be replaced. And one of the reasons why the alliance is 15 years is because generally medical equipment, most modalities have a seven to eight year lifespan, depending on what it is. So it allowed for two complete replacements of our medical equipment. Uh, so the TMP, um, we look at that if we, by fiscal year. We know what has to be done for 15. And we look at specific pieces of equipment and we say, do we really need to replace this now? And, and something, um, Phillips helps us make better choices. Uh, again, in a typical transactional um, type of environment, you would go to a vendor, and, and I don't know that any of us have ever gone to a vendor that said, you know what, I really don't think you need that new widget. Why don't you wait? Because um, the one that you have seems to be working well, and the new one doesn't give you a whole lot more benefit. But Those that's people get paid for that, right? They get paid to sell more. Exactly. exactly. But but the way things are now, that that has and does happen. Um, sometimes they'll say, "What well, again? What you have is functioning correctly, and even if we sold you our newest one, it's not going to make that big of a difference. Why don't we wait?" Um, it could be two years, it could be three years, but maybe something's coming out that would be more beneficial or, or the whole concept of how that care is delivered could change and the need could change. That's interesting. That, that's a really interesting point. Like, oh, I, I know the roadmap, you don't. And so you may just want to wait, right? That's, well, that's a good insight. <laughs> True, true. Or, or even if they don't, you know, sometimes they do know the roadmap, perhaps, and then sometimes they don't. Yeah. Um, I think oftentimes they don't, but they just have a good feel since they are here with us. And, and, um, 
you know, unless you you know who works for Phillips and who works for AU Health, it's very hard to discern. Um, our badges look basically the same, and, and we kind of work together as a team, making the best decisions. So it's interesting. Now, when I first got hired into healthcare, I was working at a university, and I was reported to the tech side of things, but I worked in the health and counseling center. So, uh, you know, I felt like I belonged to the health and counseling center even though my boss was over in technology and the one I had to get days off and everything, I would go to him and say, Hey, sign these days off. He just sign away. But like, for me, it's like, I didn't miss the tech people when I left. I missed the people I worked with, which I imagine is a similar situation for your Phillips representative that they, they almost feel a part of the hospital. So that, that's a powerful thing. It, it really is. It's a, it's yes, it's a lot of fun. It's yeah. a tight group and, and functioning quite well. Well, and Stacey Brooks commented in, in the in the side, and she, uh, I assume it's a she, uh, said Phillips recommended AU Health by non-Phillips equipment in this case, which is, that, that's uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, that know, is it. Stacey's wrong. If you're doing a big alliance, right? Because sometimes there's other equipment that's cheaper, better, or whatever uh, fits your need. That's correct. And, and even though this is, a, you know, a, I wouldn't say an exclusive alliance. It is that obviously we buy a um, high percentage of Phillips equipment. There have been times when we have not, either because Phillips didn't make the equipment or because a clinician had a specific need um, that Phillips couldn't fill. And, and they help us buy it. And they, in fact, are the ones who purchase it and um, who who do the business with the various um, various vendors and make sure the equipment gets through the door. And then we, we lease it back from them. So, yes, yeah, Stacy, absolutely. Yeah. So it's interesting, I, you know, sitting back at kind of a 500 foot level, if I, if I look at what you've done, you know, with your, your technology management plan with, uh, you know, with you're essentially just doing good business processes and good planning, but it's almost like by having the alliance, it forces you to do that because I think a lot of hospitals maybe don't spend the time to do it. They don't bring the right parties together in order to do a comprehensive plan. You know, maybe some do it for their x-ray machines, but they don't do it for their, you know, their ventilators or whatever else, right? But, you know, this almost packages it in a way that, that you're taking the time and, and planning it appropriately, which, you know, it, it sounds so simple, right? Like, oh, we just spent time actually planning what matters. <laughs> um, but that's much harder. It's easier to say than it is to do in a complex organization with lots of parties that have their own vested interests. Is that a simplification of it or is it kind of a ring true? Yeah. I think what you're saying is very accurate. It, it is difficult. Um, it's difficult to know what your colleagues in a different area need, what they have. Maybe they have a piece of equipment they're not using that you could use. It, it, it is difficult. Um, yes, and it, it's led to some interesting findings. Um, specifically, we've done one, one of the consulting projects they did early on had to do with ultrasounds. We had a very large number of ultrasounds here in the organization, and um, you know we did an assessment. What kind of ultrasounds are they? Are they being used for line placement? Are they being used for diagnostics? Where are they? How much are they used? And do we really need them? Because it's it's we could get an ultrasound request um, several a month for for a new piece of equipment, and so it was it was an interesting exercise. Something that I don't know. Um, I wouldn't say that folks wouldn't have thought to do that exercise, but who would do it? Who had the resources to do it and to track them all down and to do the research? And so Philip helped us with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> who would need that? You know, I mean, who, who would feel that's their job and their responsibility to do it? Right. right. It, it was something that definitely our CFO and, and other clinical leaders were very interested in, but it was, it is hard to execute. So Phillips went through, they, they um, help him, you know, with our help um, finding the, the ultrasound units, you know, in the drawer, in the closet, under the blanket or wherever it was, you know, what type of unit is it? How often is it used? And um, we were able to do a utilization study. And in fact, Phillips uh, came up with a tool that's a pretty simple algorithm. And when I get a request now or others that they, if someone wants a new ultrasound, they're able to tell us, you know, when, what days are you going to use it? How many times do you think you're going to use it? You plug in some numbers and we say, well, that looks like that might work. Or you know what? I think that your colleague down the hall has an ultrasound. And since you only would need it several times a week, maybe you guys probably could, could share that one. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, been a great exercise. Nice. So a nice tool for, uh, you know, kind of advanced utilization. We can put analytics in there since it's healthcare and we need a few buzzwords, right? <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, so you mentioned briefly some of the consulting services, and, you know, and, and, and you said you'd talk about it. So yeah, let, let's uh, let's hear about what what are the, some of the consulting services that you are part of the alliance. What are you hoping to work on there? I know you're just getting started with that that phase of the effort. Well, um, so we're in the middle of year three and we did start consulting projects uh, last year. So some of the, the big ones have to do with care facilitation. Um, well, let me back up. Phillips wanted to work with us on, on some key initiatives, clinical growth, patient throughput and quality. And so all of these initiatives tie back to that. So care facilitation was one. We did a bed management. Um, Phillips helped implement a bed management system. We had alarm management um, and Coming up in the next fiscal year, we're working on some workforce optimization um, plans, hopefully, that and some advanced provider plans, but that's for the future. Some of the um, successes, though, other than the ultrasound project I talked about, care facilitation um, has been a, a biggie. They, they went through and they looked at the entire intake and outtake process. I'm going to simplify this, but they, they looked at the um, intake and outtake process, the number of staff we had, the type of staff we had, how were we um, handling patients that didn't have a ride home? Uh, how do we get physicians to write orders earlier in the day, maybe uh, instead of later in the day? All, all kinds of different things. They looked at it from start to finish. And again, that's the kind of project that's very hard for somebody in the organization to have the bandwidth to work on and, and to, to study from, from start to finish. So that's been a very successful project. Um, staff have been rearranged. Bed management system has been put in. There's a new way of, of um, there's a new staffing model for, for those different departments. And it's, again, we've already started seeing some pretty hard numbers in the last um, four months related to the savings for those initiatives. Um, don't want to get for us as well. Uh, you know, I mean, I, maybe, maybe that's not your area, but it seems like that would impact, impact HCAP scores as well, as far as patient satisfaction scores for your organization. Well, certainly, that probably wasn't what you went into it, like, oh, let's impact our HCAPs, right? Well, and certainly we're always looking at those patient sat scores and the HCAPs, and, and I don't know that we've made the needle move in that arena at this point, but that's certainly, because um, we just now, we probably have a quarter's worth of data, and HCAPs generally runs pretty, pretty far behind with the reporting. Um, you have to wait a fair amount of time. But, yeah, certainly that is something that we would expect um, to, to see as a, another improvement. And, again, I, I'm, I am focusing on the finances of this, but this is about better patient care. It's about um, taking taking better care of the patient, trying to make sure they are taken care of at home appropriately through home health, they don't get readmitted, and improving that whole experience. Hmm. Well, and I imagine if you're you're speeding the throughput and getting the X-ray done earlier or or the order done earlier, then you know then you find stuff earlier and you, you see all of those benefits to the patient as well. Absolutely, and, and have another bed available for the next patient that comes through that that needs us needs us again. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, spent a night on the freezing uh, ED table. I, I'm all about bed management and having one available. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, do that'll do it. Yeah. That's my own personal take. But so, you know, kind of to, to wrap this up, where, where do you see this going next? So what, what's on the roadmap? I mean, I think it, you said it was a 10 year alliance or, you know, 15, 15, 15. we're in the middle of year three. Yeah. So uh, well, on the roadmap, you know, what are you looking for? Sure. I did speak some about innovation. Um, and so we've, we've kind of exhausted that one. Hopefully uh, if I have a chance to, to talk with you again, I'll have a better report on that because that is just spinning up. The, the ones that are still on the pipe, there's more to do with the consulting projects. Again, with that workforce optimization, we're excited about that. Um, and then something else that, that we are um, cautiously optimistic about is the Columbia County project. Um, we're in Richmond County. We're part of the CSRA is what we call it. We're, we're right on the um, Savannah River. So we half of our population comes from South Carolina. Well, again, I'm oversimplifying. A large population that we serve comes from South Carolina and then also from Georgia. So mm -hmm. Columbia County is one of our neighboring counties in Georgia. It's the largest county in Georgia without a hospital. And we are in the middle of a process, well, hopefully, hopefully towards the end of a process to see if we can be awarded a certificate of need to build a hospital in Columbia County. And that hospital would be very different in terms of concept for what we have here in our downtown office. Um, we're a large academic medical center. That hospital would have more of a feel of a private hospital, very high touch, high feel. And, um, 
that's something that Phillips can help us with. They have smart rooms at, at different hospitals around the country. They have um, different ideas for lighting and room setup. And in fact, they were instrumental in helping us get our certificate of need application even together two and a half years ago to move forward on that. So that's something that we hope will clear all the hurdles on here soon and um, be another great opportunity to partner with them and, and again, rethink everything and, and um, reconceptualize healthcare and make a better better solution for the patient. There's no more fun time to plan healthcare than building a new building, a new hospital. So <laughs> that's exciting. Very good. Thank well, I, we're up against the clock, so I, I really want to thank my guest, uh, Nancy Hannon. She's the Phillips Relationship Director at Augusta University Health, uh, talking about their alliance with uh, Phillips. Thanks for joining us today, Nancy. Thank you.